you know, I'm only, uh, I'm five foot five inches tall. Uh, when I strapped on that P-38, which had uh, almost 400 horsepower, four fifty caliber machine guns and a cannon in front of you, uh, I felt like the other guys didn't have a chance. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. In New Guinea, uh, what, uh, what they did was uh, they just uh, would hack out a runway and put PVC down as pure steel planking. And we lived in tents. We were elevated. So we got off the ground and we had lived under mosquito bars uh, all in our tents. Four to a tent. The living was pretty rough. Uh, the food was terrible. We were getting a lot of bully beef up from Alaska, from uh, Australia. <clears throat> I think probably the major role that we did was escorting bombers. General Kenny uh, in uh, the Fifth Fighter Command <clears throat> had all he had was P-40s and P-39s and uh, they didn't have the legs of the range to go after the Japanese bases that were located uh, real close. And the Japanese were just almost down uh, to uh, uh, being, being able to launch an attack on Australia. So uh, he screamed for the P-38s and we, got, we, we went over uh, as, as, and uh, replaced those uh, P-39s with the P-40. And it was a turning point of the war because we could now escort and cover our bombers who went after the Japanese bases so they could no longer launch an attack. We were uh, stationed at Dobadura and we were going against the uh, Rabal, which was a very, uh, on New Britain and Island, uh, uh, the New Britain Island and Rabal was a big base there. They had uh, hundreds of Japanese forces, uh, airplanes of all description. They were even being hit from Guad um, um, airplanes out of the 13th Air Force in Guadalcanal. And it was there, uh, we went in uh, to escort the B-25s who came in on the deck going after their shipping. And uh, I was, uh, flew wing, uh, it was a very early mission for me, second or third I would guess. And uh, we got into a, a fight with, a, we had 18 P-38s and we tangled up with a, a twice that many uh, airplanes, uh, Japanese airplanes, most of them were Zeeks, Zeros, very maneuverable. And it was during that encounter where uh, uh, I, uh, we got in a, in a fight. Uh, our tactics were, uh, we, we never split up more than, we always kept two together, uh, elements together. So you had, a, uh, you'd have a flight of f four, that would be Clover Red leader, they had a leader, he was leading and he had a wingman and then an element leader said, and he had a wingman. And we always broke up and fought in twos, that way we keep each other's tails clean. And uh, we were broke up and fought with two. My elevator leader shot down one airplane and there were two of them and I went and, and got the other one. That was my first one. I always felt, you know, I'm only, uh, I'm five foot five inches tall. And uh, when I strapped on that P-38, which had uh, almost 400 horsepower, but total, uh, four fifty caliber machine guns and a cannon in front of you, uh, I felt like the other guys didn't have a chance. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a little, it, it's a funny thing in that business. You, you know good and well when you are on, you, you jump on one of the, uh, the enemy airplanes, that gentleman knows you're there and he normally calls out to his wingman or somebody says, hey, there's a P-38 on. So you had to be very careful. Uh, you, you had to kind of shoot and get the hell out of there. I hit him and I rolled him and then I got out of, out of dodge. I got away and uh, did that twice. The only reason I know that the airplanes were destroyed was somebody else was in my flight behind me and they confirmed that, uh, they, were, that, that, they, that they crashed. I, I, I never was a big promoter of running up a, a score or anything like that, but I, uh, it, it doesn't surprise me. The guys that we had, we had 40 aces in our group. 
Well, I guess uh, when I, uh, I think I became a file ace when I got the fourth and fifth one together at WeWax, I think. And uh, when we landed at the, de we always debriefed and because uh, uh, many times, as I said, you would not know if the airplane you attacked really destroyed and many times your wingman or the guy behind that w w could confirm the victory. Uh, and uh, after we got, uh, the intel officer said, well, you, you know, Captain, you're now an ace. And I said, oh, that's nice, you know. <laughs> Colonel McDonald was leading the flight that day. I, I was operations officer of the 432nd group, uh, a squadron in the 475th fighter group. And uh, they said uh, the, the Japanese Navy was coming down uh, with bringing a bunch of uh, troops to uh, uh, land on the uh, city of Ormoc to fortify their forces on the island of Leyte. We had just made the landing on the east coast of Leyte. Japanese forces were in the center and had some guerrillas fighting over the, on the uh, west coast uh, and, and survivors, the Bataan death march that had come out when the, the Philippines, uh, Manila fell. And so I, uh, uh, he called me, uh, he said, uh, PJ, I uh, understand you got a pretty good mission tomorrow. I said, yes, sir. He said, would you mind if I lead the flight, or your, lead your squadron? <laughs> you know, I'm a captain, he's a colonel. I said, yes, sir, you know, no problem. You take red flight, clover red leader, you'll be clover red leader and I'll have white flight. <clears throat> well, we, we took off going over to Ormoc and the B-25s were gonna go over there and, and hit the Japanese shipping that was coming down and uh, uh, Colonel Mack called me when, when he got over there, he said, PJ, they didn't re completely refuel my airplane. I gotta go back and get some gas. So he turned around and went back. So I took over the squadron. <clears throat> and I saw some Tonys, that's the ME-109 version uh, uh, of the uh, Japanese airplanes, inline engine airplanes, good bird. I saw it, about 18 of them in a big V formation. They were up underneath the, uh, slight overcast and I circled around on top of that overcast and came down between them and I went up and knocked off lead and uh, I got in a big fight and I was just pulling around to, uh, uh, t we had maneuvering flaps so we could turn with them, we wouldn't even try to turn with the Zeke's or the Zeros, uh, but the ME-109, uh, the Tony, we, we could do a little bit. We had maneuvering flaps at that time, L models. And I dropped him a new and I was just pulling around to get a little lead on him. And all of a sudden, you know, one minute I'm doing 400 miles an hour, so at 20, 30,000 feet, and the next minute, bang. I didn't know what hit me. Turns out, there was a young man named Lassiter. He's not one of his first, he, he was relatively new to squadron, and he was the wingman of somebody in the back of my flight. And I, uh, nobody knows where he came from. I was in lead, how he got into me. He came right up underneath me. I looked up in the rear view mirror to see, uh, I, I turned because I could almost glide home to home plate. We weren't that far from home. And I looked up in the rear view mirror and uh, both tail booms had been sheared off. He, he came up, must have come up right in front of me. But a anyway, I, uh, uh, then the uh, right wing fell off and the, right engine, uh, and I popped my canopy and the fumes, everything came in from that gas from the right engine uh, exploded and I went out with a kind of an explosion. I had a lot of flash burns. Uh, and uh, I, uh, we were, I don't know where we were, maybe 20,000 feet, 25, 30, whatever. But I free fell for a while because we always free fell because uh, the Japanese had a habit of strafing us in a parachute. So. I free fell out of the fight, and I noticed I was right over the Japanese Navy. I call it my one man a parachute assault of the Japanese Navy. Uh, I almost got caught up in the rigging. Boy, they had gunfire going like crazy. Of course, they weren't shooting at me, they were shooting the B-25s, but I went right through that stuff. And I landed and uh, opened, you know, popped my uh, uh, boat, little life raft. <clears throat> And uh, the Japanese at that time, the fleet had gone south. They were all, it was just relatively quiet around there. 
And I got in my life raft and I was pretty badly burned. It was mostly flash burns as it turns out later. Uh, two or three first degree burns, but uh, in my arms and around my ears. But uh, I, I, I got in there and I, uh, this, this was early in the morning and I floated out there all day. <clears throat> the next morning, uh, uh, an airplane came over me and circled. <clears throat> By that time, I'd been washed over with salt water and I'd gone my, uh, my, uh, and beat in the, my burns. I'd, I'd taken out some uh, sulfur that I had. Uh, we had little kits in our rafts. Uh, I didn't have any water. I'd taken that out. I threw it out because we were sitting on these things and I got tired of sitting on the damn thing. So I didn't have any water or anything, but I used the sulfur and I had, a quinine um, a shot, so I gave myself a shot of morphine. <clears throat> and uh, he, he circled around and then came in and I uh, felt the hits before I even uh, saw anything. And he put, fortunately, he never hit me, but in two or three, uh, 30 caliber, the must have been, went in to my boat. <clears throat> and I could hear it. And it had tubing around it, so I, I was able to uh, keep air in it, and although it hang with my legs in the water a little bit, uh, he just made one pass and left, because after he made that one pass, or after my heat, let me put it this way, I, the bullets hit me before I could hear the sound, because sound didn't travel as fast as the bullets. So, but as soon as I got hit, I heard him, and then that's when I turned my boat upside down. Uh, you know, it's, it, it was blue on the bottom, but anyway, I, I, and I swam away from it a little bit. Of course, I had a life preserver uh, until he was gone. Then I went back and got in. I washed ashore, and I turned up, turned my boat over and pushed it away, and I took all my insignia off. I don't know why I did that. <clears throat> and I went up a little trail, and uh, I heard somebody coming down the trail. And there was a lot of shooting going on because apparently one of the Filipino guerrillas, our friends, saw me coming in. And he, of course, he didn't know, I guess, whether I was Japanese pilot or what I was. But uh, in, anyway, uh, uh, he came down and he stood right in front of me. And I, I, I heard him coming down. I st got off the, the trail and got behind a great big old um, but, uh, leaf. Call them bamboo things, I think we call them. Anyway, I got behind that thing, just off the trail, and uh, he stopped right in front of me. And I, uh, I was getting pretty faint. I was standing, and I, I, I was going to collapse or any of that. Or, so I just pulled out my forty-five. Normally, I had ball ammunition, and you also we carried a little package of birdshot, because if you went down the jungle, we figured you couldn't you'd stand better chance of shooting something with a shot in it than you would with a slug. But you couldn't feed those in through the chamber into the, into the weapon itself. So I always slipped one of those things into the chamber. And with ball ammunition, in, 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 I would slam it in so that if I needed the ball ammunition, all I had to do was fan that thing and throw that one shell out and a good round would go in. Well, I'd forgotten that that round was in there and <clears throat> being out in the water, all of the, the cardboard had opened up and all the shot had ran out. So when I pulled my gun out and put it, I'm like maybe three feet behind this guy, uh, I kicked off a round and it went about that loud. <laughs> and all it did was hit him in the back of the head with a wad of paper. And it, all it did was piss him off. He, he turned around and he chopped that big old thing I was hiding behind. <laughs> and he, uh, I said, Americano. And then I saw his, uh, he, he wasn't, uh, wasn't Japanese. I said, Americano, Americano. And he said in perfect English, you know, why the hell didn't you say you were American? <laughs> anyway, uh, he took me in and I lived, uh, these gorillas that all survived the Bataan 
death march coming out of Manila. And uh, he took me uh, into uh, uh, the guerrillas had survived the Bataan death march, had a regular unit in there. Major Nazaro was the commander, a little, they, they, they were uh, organized into a, he had a battalion of forces, had an aid station. They, they would boil coconut oil and uh, saturate it with, with uh, they were getting medical supplies from MacArthur, sending up submarine stuff through via submarines. And they would bathe my oil, all, bathe my arms with this oil all the time. <clears throat> and I, have, I don't have very, too many scars from it, uh, more on the elbows. And, uh, anyway, uh, they nursed me back to health for about, th maybe about three weeks. I was up and around. <clears throat> They uh, wanted to be sure I, uh, they, they wanted to protect me because they wanted to show all the natives that uh, an American, because MacArthur had said, I shall return, and here I was a living example of, to them. Uh, the, uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had landed on the east coast of Leyte. The Japanese had the middle of the island, that's where Ormac was, and that's when they had their forces in. The guerrillas were on the west coast, which uh, just a, a small amount of them, uh, probably 150 in, in the total. And I was living with them and fighting with them. And uh, the uh, first cav made a landing on Ormoc going after the Japanese. So the Japanese in the Senate Island, they came out and they went into our AO, our area operation. And we had, they, they just overwhelmed us. We had to get, to get out of there. So uh, fortunately, uh, a uh, Alamo scout, it's, 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 it's two Alamo scouts dropped in on us <clears throat> and uh, they radioed and uh, first of all, a, a PBY, uh, no, a, a PT boat came to pick me up and uh, there's another pilot there, a Navy pilot, American had, had been shot down too, to pick us up and evacuate anybody else at, uh, at to help them out because the Japanese were just overrunning the Filipinos. And uh, they came under fire and the PT boat didn't get to them, up to me. He turned, they tur turned around, got the hell out of Dodge. And, but uh, I guess four or five hours later, a PBY came. And he came under fire, but he didn't care. He came right up on the beach and both two Americans, we got in that, plus a couple of Filipinos. And uh, so I was, uh, went back to my unit, and I went down. To, I was I only weighed 100 pounds. I'd lost a lot of weight and everything. <clears throat> so I went down to Philippines, uh, uh, Australia, to uh, fatten up a little bit, and uh, uh, got back and uh, resumed combat operations. The Japanese were were uh, flying, uh, picking. Uh, they had some uh, uh, tankers that they would load up with oil and Borneo and sneak up and uh, get real close to the coast there. So a B-25 is going to go over. To, that's about the only way Japan was getting any oil was from, from those uh, lanes. So the B-25 is going to go after them. So we accompanied them over there. Uh, I was leading a, uh, the squadron and uh, out of the group. Uh, I was on the 432nd squadron. The 431st Squadron was flying top cover, and uh, we got over Saigon, and we were engaged by about 30 uh, Japanese uh, fighters. And uh, we uh, uh, we were doing pretty well with them, and uh, it was uh, uh, like I said, I shot down a couple of them, and uh, the uh, 431st Squadron. <coughs> uh, came under fire at, uh, 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 after we did, because uh, we were close, closer to the bombers, and the B-20, uh, the, the 431st squadron was, was doing high cover. Well, we, we, uh, we did the strike with the bombers heading home, and uh, the uh, 431st <coughs> uh, came down and joined us and uh, 
because we, we felt that there wasn't any, any enemy problems. Well, they, got, they came down below us. Uh, to, to conserve fuel, the lower you were with the gasoline engine, the better. So they got down below, got on the deck. Going home, what do you know? We got jumped by some more fighters. And uh, they didn't even know that they were there. And uh, so uh, uh, I got my squadron in position because they were dead meat. They were right on the deck and they couldn't, uh, couldn't turn, couldn't do anything. So I took my squadron down and we uh, kept the zeros off of them. Um, and uh, uh, when I came back, they, they wrote that up as a historic <laughs> event. And, uh, and that's where I got the Silver Star. For, but uh, I didn't do anything more than anybody else. Look, I, I was a young, a young kid. I shot down my first airplane before I was old enough to buy a drink. And I just, uh, I got paid for flying airplanes. And uh, if I got the Silver Star along the line for doing something, uh, helping my uh, comrades in arms, uh, well, I appreciate that. I guess I'm very proud that I had the opportunity to serve my country. Uh, this, this sounds a, a, a little uh, unusual that I would say that about myself and I don't like to do that. So I just say I would, it's a privilege to me that I join that category of patriots. Uh, I became one of them. Some of us, uh, sacrificed uh, a, a lot, sacrificed their lives. I'm, I'm proud that I'm a, uh, a member of that patriotic group.